Revelation chapter 4. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, beginning in verse 1, and I'm going to get us down to verse 5. Uh, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today, you'll see I'm not talking about the four beasts today. And the reason is, is because I skipped over a couple thoughts that are clearly presented here, and I want to make sure we address those the way the Lord laid them out for us. Amen. So I'm kind of backtracking a little bit. I, I got pretty excited talking about the elders last week, and, and I said, well, wait do you see the beast, you know, and, and yeah, there's more to talk about. So in verse 1, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Seats. Doesn't that sound like places of judgment? Amen. That's because that's what it is. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. A couple things here in, in verse 5. Number one, I'm just going to talk today about the first half of verse 5. I'm not going to address the second half there about the seven spirits of God. Now, Earlier in chapter 3, I believe it was, we had, or no, chapter 1 and verse 4, I think, uh, I gave you an excerpt. Uh, remember the little picture of the menorah and all that? And it, and it showed what I believe is the doctrine of the seven spirits of God. Uh, prayerfully, next week, or next lesson, I'm going to talk about the seven spirits of God because this is the last time, basically, that that's mentioned Amen. Uh, it, it's mentioned one more time, but, but in a little bit different context and in the same place because chapter 5 and chapter 4 take place at the same time in the same place. Um, and I, so I'm going to go back and revisit that and I'm going to give you like the seven spirits number, you know, lesson two. All right. But for today, I'm going to preach twice on the first half of that verse. There was so much, I just could not get around it. Um, and you say, wait a minute, you're talking about this verse where it says there preceded lightnings and thunderings and voices. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. Now, by way of review, to get our minds back in shape here for this, we see the one that sat on the throne. We know that that's God the Father's throne. And the Son is in His throne with Him. Amen. In other words, we know God is one, but yet they're three distinct separate people. Also, we'll see in chapter 5, and, and also right here, right in front of the throne are the seven spirits of God. So you put all together, it's the same thing. It's the same God, but three distinct persons. And we found later in chapter 5 that when they said, who is worthy to open the book? Well, the Lamb uh, of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah stands up. And so there we see three distinct persons of the Godhead. Amen. But He is our mediator. We saw there where He looked like a jasper and a sardine, which are the last and first stones on the high priest's breastplate. Uh, one representing Benjamin and the other one Reuben. We see the uh, rainbow round about the throne, which talks of God's mercy, grace, and covenant. But the hue of this rainbow predominantly seems to be emerald, which is the wonderful color and the stone of the tribe of Judah, who Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, when God called Judah to bring forth the son, it was because of his grace toward us as sinners. Amen. But then we get to this point where we see some affirmations from the throne. 
some declarations, some things that are said. Now, we don't know exactly what was said. But he says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now, I want you to know that ever since the Lord spoke on Mount Sinai, we see the same testimony about God speaking to the nations all through Scripture. And we're about to go to 140,000 places and prove it right now. But, <clears throat> well, let's just do that first. I don't want to give you too much before we do that. Go with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Any of y'all ever heard a sermon on this before? Me neither. And boy, the temptation was for me to skip right over that and jump on them four beasts that everybody wants to know about. But hey, wait a second. This is in the Word of God. Let's study this out a little bit. And I'm going to tell you my weak uh, attempt at, at trying to really expound this today is probably, it, it's a failure in the mind of God. But I hope that it, that it blesses us. Amen. So Exodus chapter 19, and I want you to look at verse 16. It says, It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. Now, are we not seeing the exact same thing that John just saw? He said the voice like a trumpet. And he's hearing lightnings and thunderings and voices. And God is about to give the law. Amen? Amen? So anyway, uh, now, now watch. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And I'm going to carry that thought into the message this morning. Okay? He says, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. What I want to tell you is here's the first time we see this. And when God speaks, we should tremble. When God speaks, the world should tremble. Seems like they're not afraid though, doesn't it? Anyway, they ought to be. Look at chapter 20. Now, this is the actual giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. Look at verse 18. He says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you and that His fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. This declaration of God, this affirmation, is called thunderings, lightnings, and voices, because it is supposed to have the effect of causing men to tremble. Amen? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of this and what are these lightnings and thunderings and voices. Amen. Go with me to Job 37. Oldest book in the Bible. Job chapter 37. And let's look at verses 1 through 5. And this is not Job speaking. This is Elihu talking to Job. But he says, At this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. Did, did you notice there? His heart's trembling and he's asking you, My heart's trembling at the voice of God. Amen. We, we're seeing the same thing. Verse 3, He directeth it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency. And he will not stay them 
when His voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with His voice. Great things doeth He which we cannot comprehend. Listen to that. He will not stay Him or stay them when His voice is heard. That's why there should be trembling. If someone preaches this text and starts to uh, open up the Word of God concerning the voice of God, it should cause a sinner to tremble. It should cause a saint that's in sin to tremble. Amen? Go with me to Psalm 18. Psalm 18 and verse 13. He says, The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave His voice hailstones and coals of fire. Now that's interesting. We hear hailstones now. We're going to see that again. Okay, but let's, let's keep going. Verse 14. Yea, He sent out His arrows and scattered them, and He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Now let me just give you a little hint here. There was one day when God shut out the lightning of the Word of God and disconfitted everything I thought I knew about myself. Amen? And that's when I turned to Him for salvation. Go to Psalm 29. Psalm 29. I'm going to read this whole thing if you don't mind. He says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Now, wait a second. We're going to be reading here uh, next week uh, about before the throne is a sea like unto crystal. Are, Are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? This is nothing new in Revelation 4. This is all God's place. And by the way, If this is true, what we're seeing, then we know that God has always had the same plan. That there was no, well, I'm I'm here for the Jews. Oh, they rejected me. What do I do now? Uh, I guess we'll turn to the Gentiles. That's the way the Protestants handle that. It's not true. This is the same God. I'm the Lord thy God. I change not, he said. Amen. We see him with, with voices, lightnings, thunderings. We see him with a throne. We see him sitting upon waters. There's a whole bunch going on in there. And it's all the same picture. It's the same thing. Anyway, verse 4 says, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the... By the way, that is a calf. A unicorn. Is, or I'm, I'm sorry, a uh, rhinoceros. Y'all ever seen a rhinoceros at a zoo? You ever seen them getting pacing? You ever seen the little ones? Well, now you got the picture, don't you? Um, anyway, verse 7. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest. And in His temple doth everyone speak of His glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. There's the waters again. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. Well, do you notice He's already king right there? Amen. Do y'all remember the lesson I gave y'all on capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? That's Jehovah. And it's a direct reference to Jesus Christ. He sitteth as King. The Lord will give strength unto His people. There you are. The Lord will bless His people with peace. (laughs) Hallelujah. That has different meaning for me now. Amen. Let's jump over to Joel chapter 3. Uh, the reason I want to take you to Joel is because um, um, this one's pointing to the end. Well, Revelation is the end. <laughs> and Joel 3 is pointing to the end of time and to the apocalypse. And look at Joel chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. He says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened 
and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Does that sound familiar? We've heard this before. We heard this over in Matthew 24 when the Lord was talking about His return. And we're going to be hearing about this again in Revelation when the Lord returns. Joel is talking about the return of the Lord and Armageddon. But look what he says in verse 16. He says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. <laughs> Folks, when, when all this starts to happen and things start shaking up and God's voice comes along and shakes everybody up, it won't bother us a bit. We're going to find peace in that. Amen? Uh, are we substantiating this here? All right. Now let's go to my favorite reference or cross-reference on this, and that is Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I know we're familiar with the book of Hebrews. I mean, you can't spend almost two years on a study and and, uh, not be familiar with it. Hebrews 12, and I want to begin in verse 18, but we're going to read down to 29 and just, just get the overall picture. I'll give some commentary. But he says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words with voices or with voice that they that heard entreated that the word would not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. What's that? That is Exodus 19 when the Lord started to give the law and His voice caused them to tremble. And we had the lightnings and the thunderings and the voices. Amen? He says, that's not what we've come to. We're not here to go back to the law. The law has done its job in our hearts, good people, and that it showed us who we are and cleaned us up and brought us to Christ all at the same time. Amen? But here's where you are. He says, but ye are coming to the Mount Zion. Now, wait a second. We're not over. So many people want to call Zion Jerusalem. Are we over there? Is there anywhere in the Bible that tells us to get saved and then go over there? Not at all. What you're looking at, this church and churches like it, Make up the kingdom of heaven who is ruled by Christ who has the keys of David who created Zion, by the way. There was no such thing as Zion until David created it. Are you seeing the picture? The church is Zion. He says, that's going to change Revelation. When we start talking about, well, there's this number of Israel and Israel that... The church is the Israel of God. Amen? But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Boy, we're going to see that. The general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's all the overcomers. There's your 24 elders right there which are written in heaven, and and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You know what you're going to find when we read a little bit later about that crystal sea? Is there's going to be thousands and thousands and hundreds of people standing on that crystal sea. Who are they? They are they who overcame the beast by the blood of the Lamb. See, there's two different categories there. There's the rulers, the 12, or I'm sorry, 24 elders. And then there's all these other multitudes that are saved, but they're not in the seats with the elders. You see the difference between the church and the kingdom there and the family of God. Anyway, verse 24, he says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, see that you refuse not him that speaketh, for they es- if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from Him that speaketh from heaven. 
I mean, I'm trying to show you a picture here. We're seeing Revelation 4 right here in Hebrews chapter 12. And God is speaking. Men should tremble. It is lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Amen? And look what some things uh, that are done because He spoke. Verse 26 says, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now He hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, that's present tense, which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now we're hearing that out of the kingdom of heaven, the voice of God Almighty is shaking things up. And it's going to finally shake things up. And there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. This, this earth and all creation is going to reel like a drunken and staggering man. And everything that doesn't stick, that's not supposed to be there, is going to be cast away. And all things are going to be made new. Now, so you see through the Scriptures, we see the same scene, don't we? All the way through. But in Revelation especially, Revelation being the end of all things. Go back to Revelation. And go back to Revelation chapter 8, please. And look at verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, I don't want to get into that too much because it's going to detract uh, from what we're trying to say this morning. But notice it's built up now. Notice that, that how... Once the seven seals are opened, now it's not only declarations, but now there's a physical effect. It's an earthquake. And you can take that earthquake and you can kind of use it to center all the events. You know, the, the dispensationalists like to say, well, we get raptured up and then there's seven seals. And then after the seven seals, then there's seven trumpets. And then after the seven trumpets, there are seven vials of wrath. And then Christ comes back and uh, the judgment seat of Christ having been uh, accomplished, but which they can't find, use a scripture to justify that. Um, and all this. That sounds great, but it's confusing as all get out when you read Revelation. We find that a lot of these things happen uh, at the same time. A lot of these things happen at the same time because you see the same language, the same things said about it. Okay? So, the great earthquake where Babylon falls might just be this earthquake we just read about here. See what I'm saying? All right. Let's now look at Revelation 11. Verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in His temple the ark of His testament. And there were, here it is again, look at there, lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now we know for a fact that that great hail comes down during the wrath of God. See how we just put some timing to that? And I can't, I can't go and point that out now, but we're going to point that out. But see how it builds? And it's still the same thing, isn't it? Look with me, if you would, at Revelation 16. And let's begin in verse 17. And let's build even more. And He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. 
And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, and saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon earth so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. I guess the point in all this, that this is judgments from Almighty God upon a wicked world. God here in Revelation 4 is giving us a rainbow uh, around His throne and teaching us of His mercy and His grace and His long-suffering and His covenant with all those who come to Him through Christ and are washed through the blood of the Lamb, they will be made new creatures. Amen. He is extending that mercy out. It doesn't apply only to the church. We live in that mercy. We're in that throne. But friends, that same merciful God is reaching out to a lost world and He's trying to tell us in Revelation chapter 4, come to Me while there's mercy. Listen to the beast as they glorify My name. Listen to the church as they fall down and worship Me. Listen to the ministry of the gospel as a as a as a sea that floods all nations. Listen to what I'm saying as my voice thunders and my voice sends out lightnings and it gives earthquakes and there's voices and there's hail. Listen to me because the next thing you're going to find is it's going to be an earthquake. And by the way, if you're in that mess, you're in trouble. And there's going to be great hail on all those that are reprobated at the end of the tribulation. I don't have time for it this morning, but I have here referred in your outline, which I'll be giving you um, at some point. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 23 through 33. When he says, basically, I, I called and you mocked. I called and you laughed. My voice is a thunder. My voice is a lightning. I'm giving you my judgments. But you laughed. So I'm going to laugh when your fear cometh. Now that's the words of God. I'm going to laugh when your fear cometh. I'm going to mock you. See, God's wrath is kindled. And it has been kindled against sin from the very beginning. And it will be poured out. That voice of God with the thunderings and the lightnings ought to cause us to tremble and turn to Him for it's too late. Look at Revelation 10, verses 1 through 7. We're almost done here. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, and when a li- as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. I wonder where that came from. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now that does not mean that the element of time leaves us. That's not true because 
how is it that we are with him for a thousand years later? You see, that that's that's not it. What what time no longer means is it's over now. It's all over. Verse 7, he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. See, we looked at that recently and found that that mystery is all of us being taken out of here and not being part of God's wrath. All of us being moved some way and his wrath poured on all those at Armageddon. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop right there. And I guess the point that we have to say is this. Storm clouds are rising. Storm clouds are gathering. Every day more and more of the wrath of God against ungodliness and sin is being built up. And men will have to face God. This is not something that's, that's really neat to know. This is something we better understand. Amen? Because we will face God. All right, let me go ahead and stop right there. God bless you. I hope that was a blessing to you.